Hello everyone and welcome to Internally Screening, where today we're going to be doing a review of Zack Snyder's Rebel Moon Part 1, A Child of Fire, which is the new Netflix release by the one and only Zack Snyder, who I guess at this point it's fair to say is a controversial director <laughs> since his involvement and then exit from the DCEU uh, with Warner Brothers and for various other projects which have been quite popular, stuff like Watchmen and 300, which I would probably describe them as crowd pleasers that have a still pretty loyal following, yeah. and then more kind of controversial stuff like uh, obviously Sucker Punch and Batman vs Superman which have been much more divisive. Now an interesting thing about Rebel Moon is that this is an original film whereas much of what he's done has been adaptation or remakes so for example his first ever film was a Dawn of the Dead remake and a lot of his other stuff has been based off of existing works like Watchmen, Batman, The Justice League etc. 300. 300, of course, yeah, yeah, another Frank Miller comic book adaptation. This is, an, and I say original, and I will explain my air quotes here. This is an <laughs> original piece by him, which uh, I believe he's only done like a few of. So he's done Sucker Punch. That's all original. Uh, that Which is all original. Okay. Uh, and he did Army of the Dead. Army of the Dead, which neither of us have seen. This is, I guess, his third in that ilk, whereas much of his stuff has been based off adaptation. Now, the reason I was using air quotes is that when this was originally pitched, it was pitched to Disney as a Star Wars film, and it was supposed to be Zack Snyder's take on the Star Wars universe, and Disney went, no, and decided <laughs> not to do it, uh, because they have a sense of self-preservation. Uh, even Warner Brothers turned it down when they made The Flash, so you know, yes. it must have taken Jesus a Christ. lot of self-restraint by them. Yeah. But what do you do when you have a script so bad that no one wants to make it? Well, of course, you go directly to Netflix, uh, which is exactly what he did. Uh, and here we are. It has been released. It is part one of a two-parter. There is also an R-rated cut supposedly coming out at some point midway through this year. Okay. Uh, but we are reviewing the, uh, the peasant cut as it is. <laughs> uh, Adam, what did you make of Rebel Moon? Uh, what indeed? Well, um, uh, where do we start? Uh, where do we start? I think I'll preface this by, you know, elaborate on what you were saying earlier about him being a divisive figure. In, uh, you know, in the wake of his exit out of the DCEU, his fan base has sort of grown and elevated to an entirely cult level new level yeah mm. the most cult like following of any director i can think of mm. in recent memory i can only think of like hideo kojima and he's not a film director right yes yeah in terms of people being uh, adoring for creatives this is something you normally reserve for like pop Actors, stars and, yeah. and rock stars and things like that yeah so the cult of snyder is probably not going to take these things lightly criticism against these films against his grand vision is met with a swift Iron Fist. Well, what I think is interesting is I really haven't seen a large scale defense of this, which I have for Batman versus Superman, which I have for Justice League. I mean, I think Justice League Snyder Cut mm. is currently sat on like a 7.9 on IMDb, wow. which tells you a lot yeah. about the, but that is kind of a, a, a wholly unique cultural artifact. I've barely seen anybody defending this. I guess what I'm doing here is I'm trying to sidestep the fact that I think this film is completely fucking terrible. Yeah. And that it is a blatant rip-off of all of Zack Snyder's favorite IPs over mm. the last, well, over his lifetime. Mm. You know, obviously, you know, as you mentioned, it was clearly designed to be a Star Wars film, but rather than really doing anything unique with the world building and imagery, it really does just parrot the best bits out of it. And in mm. some time, in a lot of cases makes it far, far worse. Mm. Uh, if you think about the design of the villains and their, their costumes, for example, where the sort of space Nazi qualities of the Stormtroopers and the Empire in Star Wars is obvious, but well designed in a kind of new and interesting Yeah, yeah, kind it's like of a different spin on it. Different spin on it. This, they reverse engineer it back to just them being literal, space literal Nazis. Nazis yeah. Pseudo boss in, in space. Exactly. Yeah. There's a lot of inconsistencies which we'll probably come on to later yeah. within the design realm and how things don't really sit together it's like there wasn't like a cohesive theme mm. like I guess that's the thing where you you know one of the first things you see in, in Star Wars in the Mos Eisley Cantina is just like this bustling world mm. of like all the, there's these different creatures and we don't know anything about them it's also vibrant and eclectic yeah. he's well, clearly kind of looked at that and just gone 
One thing that Star Wars does really, really well and doesn't get maybe enough praise for is its ability, especially Star Wars, the film, the first film, mm. is its um, amazing blend of genres, which is, you know, it's a sci-fi film, but it takes a lot of inspiration from Akira Kurosawa films, specifically Seven Samurai and stuff yeah. like that, with obviously the fighting in it and a lot of the, the sort of character setup stuff, the, like the hero's journey, etc. Yeah. takes a lot from Akira Kurosawa, which allegedly Zack Snyder did too. And if you watch the first 20 minutes of this film you'd really get the sense that this is like setting up a seven samurai type showdown yes. at the end which we'll get to because that doesn't quite happen um, and also Star Wars is mixing in all these other influences stuff like um, on westerns which this film also does where it's like you know Star Wars at its core is almost like a space western and that cantina scene is like a great example of you know yeah, walking true. into the old saloon yeah. and you've got all of these like reprobates and degenerates and a hive of scum and villainy that you know is immediately captures your imagination because it's that yeah. like subtle world building where it's like are oh, you see that thing for one second you're like oh what's that and then it cuts away because it's just part of the crowd yes and this film is kind of trying to cynically redo that yeah and it sucks <laughs> it just really it feels very soulless exactly yeah it's, it really feels like when you're watching it you can feel it trying to emulate exactly yeah. what Star Wars did as if it can just sort of like copy the homework of Star Wars without you know putting in any of the character building any of the the story set up and the the amazing pacing of that film as well you if you watch Star Wars the first it's still one of the most despite the fact it's from what like 77 78 something yeah. like that it's one of the most watchable you could show it to a seven-year-old type films uh, even though it's that old how many films from the from the 70s could you show to like a kid and they're just gonna like watch it yeah it's not just that it's like a very watchable film from the era it's the fact that we've looked back on it as like a sort of landmark moment and kind of taken it as a template for what to do yeah with it basically defines films. even though Jaws is the first blockbuster Star Wars is like the true first blockbuster because yeah. people are still using that exact template of a structure for right. a film where you blow up the big thing at the end you have your you know that it does the hero's journey in a blockbuster form in a way that people are still emulating yes yeah. exactly that in a way the closest film to this that is direct comparison would be Force Awakens because mm. Force Awakens functions in the exact same way yes, except yeah. for it is a licensed Star Wars product mm -hmm. but it was a director cynically going out to try and recreate and muster up the energy uh, and aesthetic of the original film mm. but the difference with that film and uh, something I would still defend of it in spite of the fact that its legacy is inevitably tainted by uh, the likes of Rise of Skywalker and the negative reception the around stuff, yeah. the sequels in general something that the film did genuinely succeed at is creating likeable engaging characters re-entering you into a world with like a new kind of um, peril I mean the First Order is obviously identical in basically every way to the Empire but the struggles and internal journeys that characters are going through mm. are interesting and different like yeah, Kylo yeah. Ren is like a really instantly interesting, interesting and yeah. engaging uh, character um, Rey is you know a little, perhaps a little bit more plastic and you know the Mary Sue things were coming around but like Daisy Ridley gave a lot of heart to that performance and then obviously John Boyega who did get shafted massively in the su subsequent films but in that film there's like a lot going on for his character that's really interesting now Rebel Moon yeah has basically no engaging or interesting characters whatsoever yeah I think and uh, one more note before we sort of go on to how this film starts is that the way this was uh, Zack Snyder allegedly pitched this to uh, Warner Brothers and then Netflix was that it's going to be this fucking massive film so it's like it has to be in two parts or it's going to be four hours long there's yeah. one or the other and obviously they said you're not putting out a four hour film what right. the fuck yeah. so it's going to be the two parts and we've got like well, I think it's Rebel Moon Scar Giver part two or whatever yeah, coming Giver, out yeah. but he didn't just pitch the film he pitched it as an IP so mm. it's like this is going to come out we're, we're going to make a video game we're going to make a tabletop game we're going to make all this like licensed stuff that's going to come with it We can there's going to be like spin offs and blah 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 the fact that you come with all that stuff up front implies a level of cynicism to me. Yeah. Where it's like, you can't do that stuff first. Like, mm. it's fun to think about, I'm sure as a director, where you're like, oh, I've made this great universe. I'm going to do all of these things in one go. You have to wait for enough people like it first. True. And, and I think if you watch the film with that knowledge, you can kind of just see that this is a really cynical marketing exercise and not like, it doesn't feel like a real film. Yeah, I mean, even if it is a passion project on of Zack Snyder's, he's still not done anything really to elevate it above pure fan fiction. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Like, uh, you know, he might 
be able to get joy out of sort of creating um, characters within the narrow templates of Star Wars and whatever films he enjoyed when he grew up, the likes of Excalibur and mm. things like that. I mean, Excalibur's an interesting one because that film is pure style over substance with no character building in it, and it kind of works for that one specific <laughs> film because it's just such a weird artifact. It makes so much sense that it's like Zack Snyder's favourite film because it's just weird shit happening for like two hours, and you're like, and it's just like pure mythology and like King Arthur and the fucking weird witch who lives in a cave, and right. it kind of works for its own weird, unique vibe. But what's really translated from Excalibur is not so much the psychedelic Im imagery and the, the cool visuals and, and, the, and the atmosphere what's actually mostly translated is the poor character <laughs> which is interesting I guess um, you know Zack Snyder has always been known for a very specific aesthetic quality to his uh, many of his films like these weird kind of almost chromey color graded things mm. where you've got like really dark mm. I mean it's been very comic booky which makes sense given that so many of his films are comic book adaptations mm. and maybe you know in, in a way he was kind of ahead uh, to the punch with a lot of some of that stuff you know you think of 300 and how crushed like yeah, the blacks yeah. are and it's like all sort of bronzed but yeah when you dig into the heart of like the characterization the worlds are always inevitably hollow apart from maybe you know, Watchmen. Which is his most faithful adaptation, which speaks to the fact that he's kind of leaning on the material quite heavily yeah, for that. Because exactly. I know like one of my, probably my favorite like five minutes of Zack Snyder film ever is that first five minutes of Watchmen where you have that fight scene yeah. and like the iconic, like, you know, the badge yeah. falling and then that great slow motion sequence. And that, that fight scene is taken almost like panel for panel from the comic book, right. which is kind of amazing. So in Rebel Moon, Sophia Batella plays uh, an exiled person Unknown, with a mysterious unknown. past yes. that we'll get to on a uh, an agriculturally based planet where yeah. you're in the you're in the future but they're farming crops and she or she's sort of uh, almost like a, a recent arrival yeah. from what you can tell in the film she's kind of been there she's got a storied past blah 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 uh, and she is sort of close with Mikhail Huisman's character, who is just sexy man number one, <laughs> who kind of stands there uh, brooding in like numerous golden hour shots that you know Zack Snyder obviously loves. You also have like a, an Anthony Hopkins robot for about oh, the first God. 20 minutes of the film, yeah. um, who gives you this kind of big spiel about there's a world, uh, this universe, uh, it's been colonized by humans, there's a big fucking empire that there's like stuff about there was a king and they were murdered yeah the king got killed do you know the story of our slain king and his beautiful daughter in myth she was called the chalice she was to usher in a new age of peace she along with our honored king and queen were assassinated and it's kind of immediately you see the ship arrive and it looks exactly like one of the sort of uh, citadel ships from from warhammer and then mm. it's talking about how you had a king who got murdered and i was like has he just been watching like looting videos on on youtube because this is just almost pure warhammer law uh, like straight away and it literally comes through like a warp gate and you're like yeah Interesting. Which many have pointed out looks like a space vagina. It does a bit, yeah. yeah. Um, Freud would, would watch this film with great concern, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah, yes. <laughs> well, he'd probably watch 300 with even more concern, <laughs> no, to be fair. Freud would turn this <laughs> film off. <laughs> or it would be his favourite film. There's probably no way yeah, to know. Yeah, it's true. If, if there's any Freuds in the audience, let us know. But uh, shortly upon being here and them just sort of chilling, being kind of like space farmer Vikings, mm. Ed Screen arrives, who is immediately a space Nazi. There's who, no there's no beating around the bush with that. Yeah. He comes in in full Hugo Boss garb. Yeah, literally like, we'll have images on screen right now, but it's like, it's, it's about as on the nose as you can get. Yes. And they play out this really like long, tired sequence of like, hey, well, I'm a very friendly space Nazi, actually. Blah, blah, blah. And then eventually he goes nuts and he's like, I want all the yield of the crops. They harp on that bit of dialogue, that interaction for so long. Yeah. If only we had some surplus to offer. You see, the land is rocky and yields barely enough to feed ourselves. That's up this. And at all? The land that's so fertile, your fields seem larger than what your population might need. Of course, I understand how it might seem. I mean, look at these beautiful people. I can't imagine these glowing complexions are nourished by a barren field, that's all. Just trying to understand how I could be so wrong about what this land could yield. Our beloved father is always looking out for the welfare of our village, and so insists on keeping reserves in case of famine or drought. But we have been lucky these last few seasons, and our surplus has been more than we can store. So there might be a chance that we can spare a small amount. It's always wise to hold some in reserve, isn't it, father? I'm confused, though. Curious as to why you should have me believe this land could barely yield enough to feed your people. Seems 
that wasn't entirely true. No, no, no. Wait. No one is trying to mislead you. This man has no authority here. You would be wise to ignore him. It's not quite the idyllic community I'd first seen, if I may. Offer you some advice when dealing with subordinates who need to be kept in place. <laughs> And so at, long. At this point, so basically, the space Nazis leave a bunch of people on the planet, and they're like, "You're going to give us those fucking space crops because we need them, because we're really hungry." Uh, and they're like, "Okay, fuck, this sucks." We're basically, you know, being imperialismed. We're like, you know, classic analogy to to history. I'm, I was immediately thinking like, "Oh, it's a seven samurai setup." So it's like, "Ah, oh, the bandit samurais. They're terrorizing the village, and they're like, we're going to come fuck you up if you don't do this thing." And then they fuck off, and it's like, "All oh, right, so they're going to like set up a defense on the planet. They're going to go do this thing." And that never really came to fruition. I guess it kind of half does, but... Yeah, the implication is that, ah, tune in next time to get that part right, of Right, is film. that going to happen in the next one? Yeah. Is that, okay, right. It's a really weird setup thing, because it feels weirdly low stakes. Like, number one, I was confused, because I was like, why is this, like, mega advanced spaceship with, like, hundreds of soldiers, thousands of soldiers, why are they so desperate for, like some fucking corn yeah yeah for the yield for the yield and, and like they get so caught up in the uh, the bureaucracy of like oh well actually we need this percentage of yield to survive ah <laughs> yeah. oh, but you said your, your associate there said that you had no yield spare but now you I'm gonna just hit said, you with my stick I'm gonna hit you with my normal stick <laughs> which we expected to be some kind of cool space taser or yeah. do something cool they build up to it so much and he just hits him in the head with a stick yeah it's really weird and then you have this sort of like weird and then you have the classic thing where like all the soldiers hanging out there, a bunch of dickheads. They like shoot the Anthony Hopkins bot, who then has this like weird soliloquy where he's just sat there like talking to this girl in another golden hour shot. Yeah. And they're just sat there talking. And one thing I have to quickly say about the visuals of the film: this film has like never-ending lens flares. It's like no, yeah. it's like old J.J. Abrams. There'll yeah. be like a shot reverse shot scene, and it's like lens flaring like crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's actually kind of fucking ugly. It's ugly in that it. Kind Kind of looks like a mistake that they've left in like it, it does yeah, it, yeah. It, it goes beyond that intentional kind of it's just distracting yes yeah. yeah 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 like you're just trying to watch a conversation and then half the screen's like yeah a, a fucking light bulb and immediately in this interaction that the robot is having you come across one of the first big problems with this film which is that a lot of characters just kind of sit there and give exposition yes and that is so much of the film there's so much of the dialogue is is entirely expositional and and i kind of realized that you know halfway through the film we basically really hadn't yet got to know any of our main characters mm. we knew that sophia butella was a brooding secretive woman but beyond that like she would always every time it cut to her having some kind of reaction she would always be positioned to the camera slightly like this 120 degree angle and then tilt her head like that and then just look brooding like at the camera and that was everything that was every shot it was, it's her. a very flat performance it was a very yeah. flat performance but you felt like that was the direction she was yeah, given like right, every yeah. time it's all right we need you to look at the camera over the shoulder look brooding look mm. sad and that was it that and and you know and, and every time a character was introduced to another character it was like we need to bring you on board into our crew or we need to you know get this thing done it was like just explaining how far along in the plot mm. we were yeah. there was no kind of very, very little real emotion uh, 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 and sort of internal yeah. stuff being driven forward. And then when it was, it was still it was still just exposition. Yeah, so essentially what the film then becomes is they go off on their quest, they're like, fuck the space Nazis, we're gonna fight the space Nazis. A bunch of the people on the planet are like, no, we're gonna, we're gonna do the yield for them. And they're like, well, that's a stupid idea because it obviously is, because yeah. uh, they're just gonna fuck us. Uh, so they go off to do their quest. And then the film essentially becomes like, if you've ever played Dungeons and Dragons with your friends, it essentially just becomes like an hour long bit where everyone's introducing their character. Like you do like, if you do like your first session of Dungeons and Dragons, everyone's like, oh, hi, I'm blah, blah, blah. And I was, I've got this tortured past where this happened, blah, blah, blah. And everyone goes through their, their bit. You have Charlie Hunnam. Yes. You have ripped guy. Hercules. Yeah, yeah, Hercules, that's a good way of putting it. Hercules meets Conan. You have Asian lady with lightsabers. Oh, yes, lightsabers, yeah, yeah. Who fights a spider. You, you have, have Ray Fisher, who is like the, um, he? he's the warrior guy who's like they go down onto like the planet right he's, he's the last one isn't he yeah, yeah you have Gmon what's his name Gmon oh Gmon Hansu, Hansu. Gmon Hansu. Who, who, on Gladiator Planet yeah yeah he's like a guy he's like <laughs> Zack Snyder clearly watched Gladiator was like that guy's great yeah, why yeah. isn't he in more films hired him <laughs> then put him in a scene where he's reenacting Gladiator and my god he looks ripped in this film yeah he it does. is like it is genuinely actually, terrifying yes it's true Zack Snyder will never have a man with more than like 5% body fat in his film it's, 
ever. Yeah. It is actually mental. Apart um, from Lawrence Fishburne in Batman vs. Oh, Batman. true, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that, he's actually one of the better you know, characters, yeah, yeah. Have, to be fair. Uh, I think that's everyone. You do also get Sophia Butler's big exposition backstory, yeah. which is that she was like... She was a space Nazi. She was a space Nazi. But that's Nazi. because she was taken in as a child. And who, they like killed oh, her family. It was it's essentially the story of Gamora from right, Guardians yes, of the Galaxy. Is, yeah. Her family gets killed, she gets taken in by Thanos or whatever space Hitler, and um, then realises halfway through, you know, she's an adult now, and then she's like, oh my god, I now realise that what I did was bad. And she, uh, I guess an important thing for the next film is that she was the bodyguard of a space oh. princess who has the power to bring people back to life. Right. Oh, so there's like this weird sequence where she finds a dead bird, oh, and everything's yeah. in slow motion, and she like raises up a bird. And the first thing I thought when I saw that was like, right, someone's going to die in the next film, and then the, the princess is going to bring him back to life. So, you know, for when, when that happens in the next film, remember I said it. Do we just go through each character? I mean, it's like... Well, certain ones have more interesting things to be said about them. I think that the funny thing... I want to start with Charlie Hunnam's accent. <laughs> All right, go on then. So Charlie Hunnam is like a space cowboy, and they do their their version of a cantina. Yes. The Mos Eisley Cantina. They're almost identical in every way. And it's terrible. And it's way more, as you said, like way more westerny, way more like saloony. Mm. So like the influences of Star Wars' original influences are once again even more threadbare mm. in the same way that the Nazis. Oh, let's make it look a little bit different from the Nazis. Oh, we've got a, a, a space saloon. Let's make it look a little bit different from a saloon. Yeah. No, let's, re let's reverse engineer it back so it looks more so boring. So kind of copy your homework, yeah, but change but, it. And more anachronistic to your environment in so much. Anachronistic isn't the right word because that's to do with time, but like what... what in, in so much as incongruous, perhaps? Yeah. Where, in that you've got a whole sort of space empire thing going on, frontier planets in the galaxy, and yet everything looks like it's from like 100 years ago on Earth. And I know steampunk is a thing and that's kind of part of it, but because there's so many horrible like clashes in style within this film, it all feels very jumbled and incoherent. It doesn't feel like a grand vision so much as here's a bunch of cool things that I think would look cool. Here's the yeah. cowboy planet, here's the steampunk planet. Well, it seems to me like this film was essentially an annotated storyboard and they use that as the script right. because you you literally the way it cuts between like we finish this bit next bit we finish this bit next bit we go to this kind of planet all right we probably need to have we've done two desert planets now so now we're going to go to like an urban planet yeah. and then the next one oh we'll go to the gladiator planet and you know they, they kind of go through it and then it's like oh the flashback will be on a guess what a snow planet whoa <laughs> and then it's like and then we'll go to the misty planet yeah, Fucking yeah. Hell. It's, no, like, it's like speed running all of star wars is like you know cows yeah and, and and like the the gradual development that happened across you know decades and and six films, we're just going to cram into one film because why the fuck not? Yeah, like you never really get to spend time on a planet or like there's no bit where like, I don't know, they're walking through the market bazaar mm. and, uh, and they're like, oh, we're speaking with the locals. Oh, here's a weird little side quest that we do. It's just like, no, no, no. We've got to try and bring in all three of our IP characters who we're going to have as video game classes. They all represent the new the class in the tabletop game that's coming soon for you, like 50 pounds to buy the box. Like that's what it feels like. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is a mad tangent from oh, Charlie God, Hunnam's yeah, Jesus Christ. So <laughs> Charlie Hunnam is in the can the fake cantina. Charlie Hunnam is a weird actor because I can't tell if he's good or not. I don't think he is. He, I think he's very charming. And there have been a couple roles where he genuinely does shine through. Like I think of The Gentleman he's is probably actor, my yeah. favourite thing he's done. I think he is a good actor because he clearly has charisma. But in this film, he's doing the worst Irish accent I think I've ever heard. <laughs> in that it sounds like someone making fun of an Irish person. Yes. I'm more of an opportunist, you might say. Look, I heard you in there, trying to get to Pollux. I could help you. Still, pay me what it's worth to you. Soldiers for a fight against the mother world. I feel like if I was Irish watching him do this role, I would be a little bit offended. Yes. Each character has like something you could you could do something with, but there's just not enough time. It's so hard to get invested because they literally meet and he's like, oh, I got a ship, mate. Or what do you know in his weird, <laughs> I don't know if it's Australian. But that's what he sounded like to me. Yeah. yeah. It did kind of fly all over the place. Yeah. He's, he's like, oh, oh, bloody hell, mate. I've got a oh, ship. Oh, come here on my ship. <laughs> Whatever he does. <laughs> what does an Irish person sound like? <laughs> he's completely destroyed my perception of the Irish. Thanks, Zack Snyder. <laughs> <laughs> but letting him do that is fucking action. <laughs> but anyways, they're like they go on his ship. It's literally like the Han Solo bit, where it's like yes. he gets on the Millennium Falcon, yeah. and they go off to the next planet. And then you've got 
the next guy, and then yeah. it just kind of goes in this cycle. Yeah, yeah, but I remember like, we were saying, like, oh, Charlie Hunnam's here, but now we're immediately on this next guy. Like, why is Charlie Hunnam still sticking around? It felt like his introduction was like, mm. oh, by the way, like, he kind of comes in at the end of a fight scene. Like, the way he's introduced is actually more similar to how Aragorn's introduced in Fellowship of the Ring. Right. Where they've done their whole scene right, in yeah, the bar, yeah. and then, he shows and then up, they yeah. show up at the end, but then that leads to another scene. Instead, mm -hmm. in this, it's like they have their action scene in the bar. Charlie Hunnam takes the final shot and it's like, oh, psych, I was an important character this whole time. Yeah, I've yeah, been sat yeah. in plain sight. And then rather than like the, who are you? I'm this guy. I have my own journey. I have my own thing. Get in the spaceship. Like, well, wait, we've got to go. We've got yeah. to go find Space Hercules. And so they go to find Space Hercules. Yeah. So do we want to, do we want to go through all of the different bits? I, feel uh, like... I, think some, I think some bits are more intriguing than others. Like I think, for example, with the Gmon Houndsu bit, the, the there's fun, nothing, to, there's say nothing to say about it other than the fact that it's so obviously aping Gladiator and it's mm. just kind of hilarious. Um, I think one of the more interesting parts is the Space Hercules bit. It is it's one of the It's one of the bits that stuck in my head the most out of... Uh, it felt the most blatant to me in that it was trying to set up the class for a game. Okay. It was because it was like, oh, I'm good with animals. Yes. So I'm like, you know, a hunter from D and D. Yeah. I think like he that. says he's like, he's like, I'm a prince from like a a, a thing, but like that. Then I got arrested for some bad shit, and now. By I, the way, this guy is like ridiculously ripped. I just had he's to say so that. He's so ripped, and he's like, so tanned, yeah. and he's got like these long, lustrous locks, and they're like, oh, to pay off his debt to this slaver. Uh, we'll do a bet we'll, where yeah. there's like a weird giant dragon beak monster. It's like a griffin or something, mm. and it looks very, very similar to a hippogriff mm. from Harry Potter. Obviously, I think hippogriffs are based off of griffins, so whatever it's like. But the scene functions in an almost identical way to it, where he has to like bow to the creature and then like right, yeah. earn its respect, yeah. and it shows that he understands animals. And then what it turns into is something more akin to Avatar, where he's right, got to yeah, ride yeah, the space. Yeah. Yeah. dragon things and he's like you know really struggling the first time and then he's like he gets the mind the mind connection with the with the beast and there's this whole thing where they're flying through the canyon and it's like he's like running on the wall there's loads oh and the fucking slow mo the slow mo is ridiculous at this point it's almost a joke because there was a bit where he's running in slow mo and it speeds up and then it goes back to slow mo and I was almost like just just stop, please. Yeah, yeah. Was it was it a bit where it's slow mo, super slow mo, <laughs> yeah, slow mo so, yeah, again, yeah. speed up. Yeah. Like we had this kind of like weird like. It's like they had like the knob that they were turning. Yeah, like, like, like Whoa. Whoa. yeah. It was it was just annoying because it's like, I don't I don't hate slow mo. I'm fine with slow mo. Like sometimes people will get like overly critical of slow mo, mm. but like it, it was genuinely excessive. And like the Avatar one's an interesting comparison because the scene in Avatar which I don't think is a great film by any means but the scene in Avatar actually sets something like they, they have that long sequence number one it looks way better but yeah. it also kind of it's world building that kind of builds the world yes which actually adds to it so like if you're going to do world building it should probably be relevant again at least in the same film maybe they'll bring it back in the next one but I'm not going to credit it for that this is like a one-off thing. It yeah. like never happens again. This guy is basically fucking wallpaper for the rest of the film. He does like nothing. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Whereas in Avatar, it's like, oh no, they, they fly the things all the time. So it's like, why? Right, I get why you included that yeah, scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it also it highlights the fact that the characters like getting closer Close to, to nature, nature yeah. and like understanding where the, this culture comes from in terms of like their, their way of life and their attitude towards mm. things. Yeah, in this, we just kind of get the impression like, okay, cool. He's a badass. He can do that. He can do this cool yeah, thing yeah. that may come in useful later in the film. Yeah, it yeah. doesn't. It may become useful in another film mm. but right now as you say we have all this create this crazy hectic scene with this one character and then it's off to the next guy mm. and then it's off to was it assassin uh, who's killing oh god a killing giant a spider. spider woman with like lightsabers they're like they're like not lightsabers but they are yeah it's like the clearest indication that this was clearly meant to be star wars it's like a super lame action scene which annoyingly Zack Snyder can be a good action director, so yeah. I could give this film like a whole extra point if it just had a couple of really great action scenes. Yeah, but I can't because no. all of the action in this film fucking sucks. Yeah, it's so bad. It's another one where there's just a bunch of like illogical shit. Where like there's a bit where like the spider goes to grab her with her like human hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even though she's got like two extra pincers here yeah, like, yeah. that she could just kill her with, and then the character has her arms free to grab her lightsabers. Like you're not binding her arms yeah, together yeah. or something like it has that it's like full of like crap slow-mo again and i think the thing right 
is the slow-mo here isn't so much just stylized. I mean, obviously Zack Snyder has a history of adoring slow-mo in his pictures, but here it clearly masks bad choreography or like sloppy choreography. Or lack thereof. Or lack thereof. Like there's, a, there's an early on scene where just before she leaves the initial planet, the soldiers, the Nazi soldiers, oh, trying are to trying to rape a, a, a farm girl. And this is kind of her inciting incident to be like, no, I will take charge. I will go back in to this world that I'd left behind to save these innocent people and so she gets a gun and she shoots them and then this whole sequence is like full of this sort of like push pull it unravels very slowly <laughs> yeah 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 you, you suddenly have this this action scene happening in like half speed and you kind of realize so many of like where the joining pieces are or like the lack thereof it's hard to kind of articulate, but when you've got like a normal, well choreographed fight scene, like I always, we always come back to like the raid. Mm. The raid is like the gold standard. You can see the hits as well. You can see the hits. It doesn't cut when someone's about to get There's, hit, whereas this. This, this has like the, the, the cardinal sin, um, of course, of one character fighting at any given time. You have like a, a mm. room full of people with guns and weapons, and yet they all just watch her beat up and kill one of their friends. Or and you can like see them the in the background one. sort of awkwardly like, oh, I'm, I'm coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the problem with the slow-mo is it highlights the fact that all of these people are just kind of waiting for their turn mm. and like waiting around. Uh, well, it really like, I think slow-mo in fight scenes, it has to be like a really dramatic moment. Like the raid has slow-mo, but it uses it like at really specific points and it feels way cooler and mm. way like more awesome because it's like, oh wow, like that's dramatic. Yeah. It's like, oh, look, look at that. Wow, crazy. But like most of it will be They'll, they'll save the, the slow-mo for specific points, whereas when your whole fight scene is just filled with slow motion, it's really hard to get that sense of momentum. And yeah, like, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you know, it's, it's this elastic band thing. If yeah, you yeah. just kind of feel pushed and pulled around. And yeah, you don't really get a sense of where things are going or like why characters are doing things. I don't know, like the geography is just like poorly mapped out as well. It's like a square room and they're all just sort of stood around the side waiting their turn. It's just lame. It was the first, the film's first opportunity to be like, I to show cool, us something yeah. cool in spite of the, how weak the world building had been up to that point. Mm. And instead it shot the bed and that kind of continued to be the theme throughout the film, mm. really. Yeah, unfortunately it never, it never really picks up and then towards the end of the film you have your big blowout scene where, spoilers for Rebel Moon part one, A Child of Fire, Charlie Hunnam betrays them and uh, they all get wrapped up in robots and Ed Screen appears yet again to give his Nazi speech and there's a big fight because they escape and you have a big action scene where a character who was literally introduced like the scene before sacrifices himself and it's like why would I give a fuck? Yeah. Like why would I literally why would anyone give a shit that this guy has sacrificed himself? It's almost like laughable it's like we, we can't kill off any of the IP characters we set up. Yeah. We got this guy to kill him. Even though they go to a really specific planet to grab this guy and then yeah, and I, yeah, think, yeah. I think it's that's the guy played by Ray Fisher who right. yeah yeah, He's yeah. the guy who plays Cyborg in the Justice League and like he infamously had like a really bad time with the production of that film because mm. of the way it was handed off to Joss Whedon. Apparently he got on really badly with Joss Whedon. And so it almost felt like, you know, oh, Zack Snyder, my bro, handing me a helping hand <laughs> like, with this film. Psych! Yeah, and I'm just going to kill your character off and like do, do him absolutely no service or justice whatsoever. So it just felt very backhanded and bizarre. It, it, the whole and the whole sequence is just super weak. It's even worse, if anything, than those like fight scenes because yeah. it's a lot of shooting, and it's just not very cinematic. It, it, it never, like you said, it never really. This scene really doesn't set up the like geography. Yeah, we always definitely. talk about geography. Yeah. Beyond this sort of one like little pathway between them and ship, mm. we never really get like a sense of this character is under fire from this person and like that they're in a stressful situation because of these things. It becomes like about two characters. It's like. These guys are all shooting in this direction. This one important character is doing the thing on the ship, and then Sophia Batella is running around. And yeah. that's kind of, we only really care about Sophia Batella and Ray Fisher. In well, it's scene. interesting because a film like Star Wars, they, the action scenes are basically written. So you think about the bit in the Death Star, maybe, where they're running around inside, and it's like, a lot of it is action scenes where they're shooting, but there's like actual like little individual vignettes within it that are like little storylines. So like, ah, oh, they're stuck on the bridge and then he, he uses the, the zip line thing or or even think about like the final bit where, uh, which is I guess maybe more comparable where they're in the X-Wings and they're, they're flying around blowing stuff up. Like there's loads of individual bits and things that happen within it. It's not just like, we're flying in, ah, brrr, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, which this very much feels like. Yeah. Yeah. There's a whole thing where it's like, oh, we shoot some ships, we shoot some X-wings, we go in. It's like, oh, this guy gets blown up. This guy's like, oh, yeah, we killed these guys, and you have all these like individual things. This doesn't have any of that. This feels yeah, like very said, much. It's like, just like we're shooting at them. We're shooting at them. Yeah. It feels very much like this scene was written in as action happens. Yeah. Then they wrote the other stuff that with the important characters you have like a through line. And then they were like, on the day, you're like, oh, I guess we've got to get some close-ups of these guys holding guns, <laughs> I suppose. It's so all we're like... going to put you behind that box there. We'll get a close, we'll get a mid-close, we'll get a wide. Okay, cool. It's right, now let's get another Zach character Sardis in said there. said to his AD, like, I'm going home. <laughs> right, got shit to do. <laughs> get me some close-ups. I'm going home. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, like, I've shot the shit that I care about. You fill in the gaps, bro. Yeah. But yeah, and then this all kind of culminates to... Ed screen in like a, a white shirt with it's like tucked in Again, in like a tie. The, the super incongruous <laughs> like yeah. design. And he's like fighting on a crate with uh, Sophia Batella and then he gets like beaten up and mm. chucked off. And falls off a cliff into the and ocean. And his arm gets broken and there's a lot of shots of him going, ah! Oh, but his ah! arm's completely fine. Yeah, oh literally, God, my arm! Oh, there's a big shot where it's like, it's like, the, the, it's really dramatic. Uh, and they go like, <laughs> it's, ah, oh, it's, like, it's genuinely about that convincing. It, it's it's awful. They chuck him off. He dies. They like go. That's like basically the end of the film until you have your like epilogue bit where they just bring him back. Yes. In uh, literally like the back to tank from uh, Star Wars where they had like Luke, you know, after yeah, he gets all fucked yeah. up after the the Wampa or whatever it's called. I, I think that ending bit is kind of interesting in that it was far more in interesting to me than the fight scene that preceded it and we get this sort of like ah you know Ed Screen is like the Vader to the Emperor and we get like our insight to the Emperor who is you know the space Hitler referred to earlier who had killed off Sophia Boutella's family right, and, yeah. so, and, and also what I noticed is I think to my memory he has a Northern Irish accent he does yeah so Char I think that Charlie oh, Hunnam right, having okay. that accent is actually supposed to be a clue when you rewatch it, and like, oh, he Charlie has... Hunnam gets killed though, doesn't he? Charlie Hunnam gets killed. And that's another thing with that action scene. Just quickly rolling back to that, they're all in these weird chair things that are like robots that like sort of pin them up, and like it, it's kind of a strange but not terrible piece of design. I don't, I don't hate it. It's the dude has to kill Sophia Butella, like hunky man who yeah, has yeah. no backstory whatsoever, other than he's. And a he's hunk. like, you're bloody doing, um, mate. Yeah. You're <laughs> fucking killer um, uh, and he like turns around and starts shooting everyone else and at that point no one decides to immediately execute all of the people bound and stationary yeah, like they each this. get a turn to like free each they other they all yeah. free each other no one ever gets like even closest bit to danger apart from Charlie Hunnam who immediately gets shot because you know like, yeah. as in that's the only character of any value uh, or importance that dies in that moment mm. and I just thought that was so lazy mm. like the, again again that highlights the geography thing because they actually that's actually a really deceptive piece of filmmaking because it's not that the, the geography of that scene is um, poorly illustrated the geography of the scene is deliberately obfuscated so that we can't see the fact that if this would happen in any normal like war zone all of the major characters that are being like detained would have been fucking massacred mm. immediately yeah. but by hiding the fact that we can't quite see where they all are at any given point mm. we don't have to like acknowledge directly the fact that they that this that they would have all died immediately it just feels super low stakes because you can tell that they're like we have plans for these characters so we'll kill the ones we don't like i mean charlie harnam's one wasn't particularly interesting anyway so yeah, it's he's just going, han solo but yeah. he doesn't redeem himself yeah and ray fisher's character is like oh fucking i've known him for five minutes so i don't give a shit yeah it just feels very low stakes which makes it even harder to care about the crap action because yeah. it's like i'm not like worried about any of these characters because i've had about five minutes of exposition to explain who they are to me there's there was not even like one scene in the film where like all the characters are just like hanging out yeah and no, just like right. chatting which is like you think even just, Suicide Squad did that yeah exactly it's like, I, I, I have a much better sense of character from Suicide yeah, Squad ironically. which is a low bar yeah exactly this is actually that's a good comparison this is about on par with Suicide Squad yeah. anything. and if anything Suicide Squad is possibly even marginally better it's just more grating and annoying where this just feels like I guess it's not as aggravating and unpleasant yes but it's uh, this is equally, far more, if not more vapid. This is far, yeah, vapid and more dull and tedious. Yeah. Where at least there's a kind of enjoyable hate watch ability yeah. to um, to Suicide Squad. I guess, yeah. Just to wrap up with that final 
bit at the end. Um, I, I, it introduces some kind of like interesting visual things of like Ed Screen being like weird revival tank. And it kind of reminded me again, a lot of like all these Warhammer references. Cause yeah, when this film isn't mm. parroting Star Wars, it seems to be parroting the likes of Warhammer 40K. Yes, big time. Um, and uh, you know, it, I don't mind seeing that some of those influences come on screen cause we've yet to have like a, a proper live action yeah, yeah. adaptation of that sort of stuff. It's just very weak though. It is weak and it, it it was probably the only bit of the film I enjoyed because I knew that the film was about to finish. <laughs> but I, I will say maybe the film's only saving grace, and you may not agree with me on this, okay. is that I kind of enjoyed Ed Screen in so much as he was chewing the scenery in a really satisfying way. He was definitely, of the characters, he had the most character. Yeah. So when he was on screen, I kind of know what you mean because I kind of... I did sit up a bit, yeah. just like, oh, there's a guy acting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas, like you say, Sophia Batella is like just so nothing. She's, yeah. And Chai Hunnam is so cringy. And the rest of the supporting cast, like fucking Mikhail Hoosman, like, is just like the, literally the biggest wet wipe yeah, ever. I mean, there's a lot of actors in I fact, like in A quick thing on him, it's really funny that he is essentially the useless female character from yeah. every Star Wars, uh, every, not Star Wars, but every, you know, fantasy thing ever where it's like, oh, you have your love interest come along, but who essentially does nothing nothing and has like no agency and it's not it's always a woman obviously but in this one they flipped it so that it's a sexy man now that is equality <laughs> right there that's something that he should be applauded for that they're like he's like an impressively uh uh lacking in charisma actor if i've ever yeah. seen one maybe he's good in other stuff but in this he's absolutely nothing so i, I do actually kind of agree with you ed screen is one of the better elements. It's just that obviously the character is kind of the bad. The character is very two dimensional, and as all of them are, and you know, he is just evil space Nazi. But mm. if you were to compare him to, for example, Domino Gleason's General Hux. Mm. Um, he's kind of. It's basically the same thing. I, I guess say, he kind of yeah. is the same because yeah, General Hux has something. It's just going true in the scenery, scenery. Like yeah, like General Hux is like as a character is completely nothing, but the actor kind of brings something. Yeah, to yeah, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. kind of it. Yeah, this you know. There's this kind of like wry smile on his face Ed Screen has. I think that's just something that he permanently has on his face because any time I've seen him in anything, like you see him in Deadpool, whatever other random stuff he's in, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but he's always got this kind of like cocky he smile. He was in Game of Thrones, but he thought he yeah. was too good for it. Oh yeah, no, you fucking idiot. <laughs> he moron. threw away a role in Game of Thrones. That's actually dumb as fuck. Oh, I can't rate in the him good for that. series yeah, as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. They had, and they recast him with someone who looks nothing like him. <laughs> I mean, Ed Screen is a weird looking dude, so he's kind of like a perfect... I'm kind of a fan of him, actually, now that you mention it. He's always like fucking weird. Yeah. yeah. I guess, uh, and so, uh, one, one last note for me is that when we talk about Zack Snyder films, we probably have to mention the visuals at some point, because mm. visually as a director, it's kind of his trademarks. Like, these super like highly saturated like contrasting yeah. images where it's like oh wow like it's so colourful and kind of fake looking but in like a really intentional and way. A really yeah really specific yeah. way uh, and I was really disappointed by this film's visuals because they just weren't very good there was a real sense of cheapness to a lot of it a very Netflixy kind of cheapness um, I thought probably the best visual effect they had was the Anthony Hopkins robot, yeah. which had like kind of a nice mocap thing going on. Yeah, Whatever yeah, they did yeah, you're right. Yes, cool. you know you are right. Yeah, um, yeah. But then he disappears from the film. I uh, don't also, know if he's going to be back. Micro detail. He's what he's called like a mechanicus mechanicus. Oh Minotaurum. yes, yeah, yeah. He's like another star um, Warhammer reference. Yeah, 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 which is Adeptus Mechanicus and the Mitar. Yeah, 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 whatever. Astra Militarum. Yeah. He basically just took like two things and went like. Oh, now it's new. <laughs> oh, I made it up. You yeah, can't sue me now, Games dumb. Workshop, even though I know you want want to. The problem with Zack Snyder and a really a common and applicable criticism for his stuff is that he can't shoot the low-key moments as low-key. Everything has to be a moment. Mm. Uh, so, like, that conversation between the robot and the girl is shot in, like, the golden hour with, like, the fucking sun in the background and it's, like, this, like, saturated image. It's like, whoa, look at it, look at it, look and at then it. The, and even then within the dialogue, it's all about, like, it's like this life and death stuff. It can't be, like, an intimate moment between, like, Just, like two, ca two characters, characters learning about, like, their different, like, origins. Or, like, having it, some banter or yeah, something. It's yeah, it's instead, like, the world was a better place <laughs> when the king was here. Yeah, literally, yeah. And you get, you know, Anthony Hopkins with one of the, you know, one of the most sort of grandiose and sat there with his blue yeti in his room, like, oh uh, yeah. Well, what does it say? <laughs> it was the Militarum. <laughs> the Emperor's <sighs> fucking Oh man, I've never changed. Tony. Yes, but you want to know, don't you, dude? 
Yeah, the film is just quite ugly, sadly. There's a lot of like terrible uh, green screen sets where you just can tell it's a bunch of people standing in one room and you have this like grand image projected on the back. Everything has this kind of ugly, uh, sort of almost Netflix trademark muddiness to it mm. uh, that just looks uh, kind of gross and meh. Like, I don't really know how to describe that Netflix look, but it just looks kind of clean, but m just muddied enough to be artful. I, my main problem with the aesthetics of this film is just they're so jumbled. I mean, I, I, And the design is just not great. Like, yeah. It's loads of stuff borrowed. All the guns are just Warhammer guns. Like, the lightsabers hmm. are just samurai swords, but glowing. It's like... Yeah, I didn't hate the way that the samurai sword... I mean, it's look. fine, but like they never do anything with the, it, right? The spider thing is so weird. I think one of the worst moments in the whole film visually they they sort of landing on like a planet i think it's where they find ray fisher and they've got all these like sort of skyscrapery yeah, yeah, things yeah, yeah. and they just look like boxes with led lights around them it's the sort of thing you can imagine um a kid setting up uh, and then doing like like getting like a toy Lego and it's like plane a misty to fly as well through. And the whole misty thing just seems super yeah. cheap. Yeah, like one thing I really didn't like as well, one of the opening things is like when they're on the planet that you see they have like three planets in like the sort mm. of the, the sunset. Mm. It just looked really fake and cheap. It looked like a sort of Windows wallpaper yeah, kind yeah, of creation. Yeah, like, like fucking wallpaper engine type it shit. It just didn't yeah. look very well designed to me. It looked over-designed and kind of tacky and tasteless in its design. Yeah. Uh, uh, he's like... As I made mention to earlier, he's kind of just like cherry picked different things that he thought looked cool in di for like different planets, and everything kind of has its own specific thing. But you never get long enough to like really like embed into what like the mm. actual stylistic visual palette of the film really mm. is. So it it's another reason why it leaves very little of an impression of its own, mm. and if everything feels borrowed because nothing sticks with you in a way of like that is what I could describe as Rebel Moon. Yeah. That's a Rebel Moon esque thing but he's done. There. It's a good point. Basically I think one of the great things about Star Wars and the reason it's stuck with people is that it's actually quite weird at points. But I think Zack Snyder is too obsessed with stuff looking and trying to be cool. Like every bit of the film is trying to be really cool. Like look at this guy, he's riding a fucking griffin, it's cool. And like she's got fucking lightsabers, but they're samurais that are like glowing. Oh, that's cool. And she does cool stuff. And ev because everything's trying to be cool, you never have like a genuine just bit of like weird shit. What this film ultimately ended up reminding me of was like a more lame version of Chronicles of Riddick, which is <laughs> yeah. similarly definitely trying to be cool mm. but also indulges in a lot of fucking weird shit yeah. that kind of like adds to adds to the, the the actual world building it makes me i can like remember so much yeah. stuff from that film i can like see it in my head right now because even though it's trying to be a bit cool here it's also like oh what if we just like had this weird what thing? if we talked used dead bodies to communicate as like yeah, intergalactic yeah. <laughs> cell phones yeah and we, 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 we start sexting on it and then it's like <laughs> oh yeah and there's a fucking planet where it just like fucking blows up because the sun like the way it like revolves around the sun and there's these fucking weird Roman soldiers with like spinning heads it's like that that's cool there's nothing memorable in this it's all just like facsimile fucking like amalgamation AI generated mm. slop from everything like even even war AI hammer. generated is a really valid criticism actually because I know it kind of gets it, it, you know it gets thrown out a lot it gets thrown things, out yeah. a lot thanks to its you know like its popularity right now but this is actually a really great example of something agree, that yeah. really does feel like someone went I want to write Star Wars but I don't want to get sued how do <laughs> I put my big budget film out there Ah, thank you, ChatGPT. Like, that, that is kind yeah. of it. It's fan fiction quality. Ultimately, it probably was supposed to be a fan fiction of Star Wars and ended up being a, a worse fan fiction of Chronicles of Riddick. That would be basically <laughs> how I describe it. But I would watch Chronicles of Riddick every day. Oh, watch 100%. It ten more times before I watch this one more time. I would just watch Chronicles of, Chronicles of Riddick full stop. Yeah, because it's great. Yeah, <laughs> and I, 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 I have no intention of ever watching part one of this ever again. We will probably watch part two yep. out of duty. I'm not watching the R-rated cut for this either, and I don't... I don't care if the Zack Snyder cult is like so sold on this idea that oh he never he just put out the shit one on purpose. <laughs> we were talking about this yeah. when we were watching it. Like imagine having the balls to say like immediately after your film has come out. Don't worry, you might not like this film, but that's because I deliberately put the shit one. You out idiot! First. You watched the wrong version. <laughs> you watched the shit one. You watched the version that I put out first. You moron! Wait you for the R-rated idiot! <laughs> How dare you say anything about this movie? <laughs> I've got the R-rated one in my back pocket. It's like when people say like. Oh, 
oh, this game's great if you buy the DLC. It's like, well, the game should be great. Like, why, am yeah, I, why do I just yeah, spend yeah. another 30 quid on top of the 60 quid I've already paid for it? Just put out the right version first, Slider. It's like, you're on Netflix. They don't have any content filters. You could just make it gory. Also, the idea that this film instantly becomes better because it's got blood in it. CGI blood. Yeah, I mean, what the fuck? Yeah, you know. but yeah we'll see. We'll but, see. You know, maybe I'll eat my words. Maybe, maybe I'll check it out, and it will be like Justice League, and it'll be a completely different fucking uh, film. It, like, that's the only way it could be good, though, yeah, is yeah. if it was a completely different film. So, what would you rate it? <laughs> I'm giving this mess a two out of ten. It's deeply unsatisfying on every level, and outside of the joy, I've actually had a ro remarkably good time reviewing this with you. <laughs> it's an incredibly joyless experience. Mm. You know, Ed Screen is fun. Uh, he chews the scenery, but everything about this is powerfully powerfully bland uh, more do you rate it yeah it's like a two but it's like it's close to a one right. it's real close to a one and i've seen one out of tens that i've really enjoyed more than this right that you've got um, more out of like i have a real hatred for this film which i don't for all of the like one out of tens that i've seen it's just uh, uh, a deeply deeply cynical cynical uh, yeah. horrible marketing exercise that's been put out as art and if you defend this please watch more films yeah. because yeah, I, that's I, what I, would I don't say, know yeah. what you're seeing if you genuinely like it fair enough but like I, 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 if you like it and you've only watched Zack Snyder films or yeah, like yeah. big budget big budget blockbusters then I don't know diversify well, maybe watch some of the things that Zack Snyder watch Chronicles by. of Riddick that's watch the Chronicles real of message. Riddick watch Seven Samurai watch the things that Zack Snyder parrots in this film yeah, yeah, for because sure. you'll probably get more out of it than uh, you would out of this product so, I agree, yeah. and a product is a good way to describe it. So thank you for watching everyone. We've been internally screening. If you've enjoyed this video, press the like button. If you've not enjoyed this video, press the dislike button. Subscribe to the channel because we've got more stuff coming out and we'll see you in the next one. Peace.